Welcome to Testimony Mountain. We've had a few weeks off because of travel and uh, rescheduling some things, but we're glad to be here and I'm so excited again to have Alice and Nikki with us, this mm -hmm. amazing mother-daughter duo, and just being able to share more of their continuing journey uh, in this healing process. And so just want to welcome you guys. So glad to have you back and excited for what the Lord is just going to release today through you both. Well, I didn't get the blue memo today. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided it would be weird if we were all three wearing blue though. <laughs> but true. you ladies look beautiful in blue. So yeah. And you always look beautiful in black and white. Oh, thank you, daughter. Thank you, daughter. Yes. Well, thank so, you. Um, thank you, Adina, for having us on again. Um, I just will never get over the privilege that it is to just share and testify of what the Lord has done. Um, not to be cliche, because I know it's called Testimony Mountain, but Really, um, I just think it never gets old to be able to rehearse and remember. Um, and sometimes in these moments, I think I'm just as encouraged as the people that are watching are um, hopefully encouraged because it's good to remind our souls um, of truth and what God has done. So, yeah, so we're excited for today. Absolutely. And I hear, Adina, you were in our sunny part of the nation I was. We just got back from Florida and had an amazing time there with some friends and some different meetings and so on. Uh, we were kind of joking because here in Texas, it's like 104, 105. Mm. And uh, we were like, this is so, so nice. 80, 93. It wasn't bad at oh. all. <laughs> oh, but we have the humidity. Do you guys have the humidity in Texas? Uh, not quite as bad as you do, I think, in the Tampa area. So, yes, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> there is some difference, but uh, mm -hmm. it is a toasty summer. And but we're Whenever glad we ask uh, what the temperature is. It's always 95 degrees, but it, with the humidity, it feels like 105. So, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> so, our topic today is kind of interesting. And do you want me to kick it off, or what do you feel, Adina? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Alice. You go ahead. Okay. Um, we're discussing what do you do if you have been diagnosed or feel that you might have a diagnosis of a mental illness? Mm -hmm. And where do you go from there? And we're going to split it into two parts. So I'm going to handle the um, side of it with therapists and psychiatrists and such. And Nikki is going to handle the spiritual side of it. So uh, I have a lot of notes, guys. So it's going to be glasses time. We have to do the glasses. But they're cute. <laughs> so um, the first thing is uh, there's, there's a shock. When, when you get told that you have a diagnosis, let's just say for sake of argument, it's bipolar. Um, I'm just using that as an example. There's always a shock because it, it hits you, but it hits the family, it hits your friends. And, you know, whether or not you come out with it, chances are if you go in for a diagnosis, you've been displaying already. You've been right. displaying symptoms. Yeah. And so the thing is, you want to know that you can either become, you make the choice at that point to become a victim or a victor. And that is your choice because it is actually, you know, the I have here the path to a life that involves mental illness is one of personal responsibility and the decision to carve out the best possible life in spite of the limitations the diagnosis holds. Mm -hmm. And so it's a self-inflicted journey. And I have found that to be true. Now, I was diagnosed, um, I wasn't formally diagnosed until I was 42, but I have known since my 20s, you know, and gone through therapy since my 20s from a traumatic childhood and upbringing. And 
that's on another show if you want to go back and watch that. Um, to think that your mental health journey is in the hands of your doctor, your psychiatrist, your, your uh, minister, your family, it is not in anybody else's hands. Your mental health journey is in your hands. And do you that mind if I interject it really, it's really quick? Um, just because, so I think a good way to describe what you mean by that is when um, I was pregnant and um, I, you know, you go in for so many checkups and they do the ultrasounds and they look at the baby and they see different things. And you um, sometimes like don't always see the same doctor, just depending schedules, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was seeing one doctor and everything's like, we're good. You know, we're just trucking along. And then I see another one. And she was like, yeah, so um, I think we'll probably induce you at like 38 weeks. And I think that we'll probably plan for a C-section because, you know, I just feel like it will make sense. And there wasn't even a real great reason um, right. at the time, but the way that a doctor, a medical professional can word something to a first time mom, I was just... Um, overwhelmed overwhelmed was like yeah. I mean, that's the best way i could describe and i was coming out of that meeting so frazzled because i was like first of all i've never met that lady before she doesn't know me she doesn't know my story she's not even my ob and she's sitting down telling me this is the, the birth plan mm -hmm. and i was talking to ross and he's he never had had a baby <laughs> So, really? <laughs> my husband. so, you know, he's like, I don't know. And it wasn't until a friend overheard me saying this, that she's like, Nikki, you know, that you don't have to accept any of that. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? She's like, you know, that the doctor is saying something emphatically, but really all they can do is emphatically suggest something. And so even to like set people free today, right off, right out the gate who are watching that, what my mom is saying is when a doctor, you know, even, even a prescription, like even a prescription that they write for you that might wind up at your local CVS or Walgreens, like you can look that up. You can look up the side effects online and you can see before you just mm -hmm. roll over and say, okay, I'm a doormat, whatever you say goes. Right. I'm so thankful that, you know, I didn't do that because I, you know, look at kiddos that are uh, born 38 weeks or, and there's just so much more developing in the womb that the Lord mm -hmm. designed it that way is what we believe, of course. But all that to say, like, literally any time that a medical professional um, says something, you don't have to take it as gospel. Yes. So hopefully that sets some people free today from that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you do have the um, predisposed, shall I say, stance to take it as gospel when a doctor does say something yes. to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And especially if you have a child and they're diagnosed with mental illness and they were diagnosed with bipolar, you would probably as a parent listen to the doctor, you know, over whatever the child has to say or if they're experiencing different symptoms. You know, sometimes there's a diagnosis that's made and it's not correct. And that's why there's so much research that has to go into it. So definitely, Nikki, that is true. And and you went through it, girl, because you had your baby during COVID. So that yes. was like, whoa, intense. That was so yeah. crazy. But um, it may it's it's much the same as an addict. If somebody is displaying signs of mental health issues, you can't bring you can bring the horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can't force somebody to take care of their mental health issues. And um, in, in DBT training, which is dialectical behavioral training, you learn a term called radical acceptance. 
And what that means is you have to radically accept that this is the lot that I've got. You know, this is what God is giving me right now. This is where I'm at. This is what's happening. And that's really a hard thing to do. So the first place to start is when you get diagnosed. This is this is pretty big. All of this stuff is pretty big, but this is huge. Get a bona fide clinical diagnosis. There's a test you actually have to take that that tells you exactly what your symptoms are. And then have somebody who is licensed and certified read that test and tell you exactly what you have. Because a lot of times doctors will just throw it out there, you know, oh, you've got bipolar, you've got this, you've got that, you know, you've got depression, whatever. For many, many years, I was just told that I had depression, that was it. And that was not the case at all. I was much, much sicker than that. (laughs) And they kept um, medicating me only for depression. And I was still very, very symptomatic and did not understand why. So you want to make sure you want to make sure that you have a real bona fide clinical diagnosis because a lot of people don't get that today um, or they haven't in the past. And the other thing is you need to find out if you have co-occurring disorders. They call them sister disorders. And what that means is that bipolar could have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder with it. It could have panic anxiety disorder with it. It could have severe depression with it. There are sister disorders to the main disorder that you have. And you need to find out what those lesser disorders are so that they can be treated as well medically. Does that make sense? And, you know, about the the diagnosis, just, you know, from personal experience with Mm -hmm. our son, he was diagnosed with bipolar. And I think it was less of a shock because we had some family history of it, you know, and some different things going down. Um, But we did tend to, you know, just follow what the doctor said, particularly, you know, in that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, the meds that were prescribed at first, it was one of those things where, it helped in some ways. He was calmer more mm-hmm. but then when he would, you know, flip, it was more extreme. And so, you know, it was having to come to the place of, do I just want to deal with it this way? Or, you know, the, the more extremes that was happening with the medication. And so it is so key that each one of us have to walk this out um, and, and use and communicate well with whoever, you know, the mental health staff you're working with is not just, you know, going, well, this is what the doctor said, I've got to do it, but, you know, taking that initiative and processing that with the Lord too. What is right for me? Just because the doctor says this doesn't mean it's right for, you know, my family. Exactly. And yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Sorry. I was just going to say with that, with processing it with the Lord, you know, to encourage people to listen, what is the Lord saying about this? Like if either we believe that he has the final word or we don't. And, you know, mom and I have talked a lot about this over the years where many times throughout our lives, you know, all in our family, whether it be me or mom or my husband or my dad, like we have been told something by a doctor and it's rattling. It kind of shakes you. And then you're like, wait, okay, what Lord are you saying? And I had, um, again, with my pregnancy, I was told that I needed to come for routine scans. But when I asked why they, again, couldn't give me a good reason why. So we went for two. And after the second one, I felt in the office that the Holy spirit said, your baby is just fine because every scan was close to 200 bucks. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. Oh, make- why did they want you coming for scans? I don't want to make this a like, let's bash the medical field because yeah. there are like God ordained people and God <laughs> breathed the ideas of medicine largely, I believe mm-hmm. into, you know, the brains of human beings. But there's corruption everywhere. Right. And so anyway, in that office, I just was like, 
she's good. And we didn't go again. This was around 20 something weeks. We went back around 36 and the doctor, again, like a guy I hadn't seen came in, did the scan and he's like, well, your baby is absolutely perfect. And he's like, everything that was said to you, just disregard all of that. And he was like, and your pregnancy is great. And like, it even appears that if you were to have another child that you would have another great pregnancy. There's no, like, you know, there's just no issues at all. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. I, you know, like I knew I, knew I heard you. And yes. so even to just encourage people to really, when you know that you've heard the Lord, um, don't doubt, you know, go with, um, we have peace about this. We can see his, hand in this and just watch how he works and how he'll save you hundreds of dollars. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Oh my goodness. Um, you made me think of yesterday, I was having a conversation with a friend and unfortunately her sister was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and she has tumors throughout and it was caught late. And so um, it's something that they've really been battling through and she's been going through the radiation. Well, all of a sudden she got to a point where she could not remember how to even work a phone. Mm -hmm. She couldn't remember people's names. She was really off the chart with her um, brain symptoms. And they thought immediately the cancer had spread to her brain. So they called the family in and they were, having you know everybody say their goodbyes it was very traumatic it was terrible and then all of a sudden they realized it was a thyroid issue wow. her thyroid medication was off or not being given correctly and the thyroid was what was causing her in addition to the cancer treatments to have this radical brain thing go on and so she did not, in fact, have it spread to her brain. And it, to me, the whole thing is just crazy. But um, they found this out, thank God, in time yes. and to treat it with thyroid medication, nonetheless. Yeah. Wow. So there's, um, yeah. there's a pastor that I worked with at our old church who would always say that the medical professionals are just practicing medicine mm -hmm. and that God, our father is the great physician. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so they were thinking and praising God right now, but yeah. You know, so you do want to make sure um, that, you know, the first thing is that you get a proper diagnosis that that's what we were saying. And also find out if there's any sister or, you know, conjunctive, disorders that go along with it. The second thing is you want to find a licensed therapist who specializes in the disorder. For many years, I went to a therapist that didn't even specialize in what was wrong with me. And so we kept going round and round in circles and she was getting so frustrated and she was getting frustrated with me because I wasn't responding. I wasn't responding. My symptoms weren't responding to her treatment because it wasn't the treatment I needed at the time. Yeah. And so, you know, that's something you really have to look into. Not all therapists will be a good match for you. Yes. And so what I recommend uh, from personal experience is that you don't go in and just dump your whole story all at once. Don't go in and just spill your guts to that therapist. Have one, two, three appointments with them and see how you mesh with them, see how it's going. And then the other thing is you want to see what kind of skill set do they have? Are they trained in cognitive behavioral therapy? Are they trained in dialectical behavioral therapy? Do they know EMDR, which is a, an eye movement thing that they do with the machine that helps trauma victims? Um, what techniques are they trained in? Are they trained in trauma counseling? If you have a trauma background, are they even trained in trauma counseling? Yeah. There's many therapists that aren't. Mm -hmm. And you'll go to a talk therapist and they have no idea about how to work with the trauma child background. Yeah. So and sometimes that, 
talking, talking, talking all over it actually just embeds the trauma deeper. Uh, Adina, you couldn't be more right. Couldn't be more right. And then also make sure that your schedule aligns with theirs that if you work a nine to five job, they have evenings available, they have weekends available, or vice versa, whatever the case is, you want to make sure your schedule lines up. And it needs to be a weekly, in my personal opinion, from what I've experienced over 20 plus years of going through therapy, it needs to be a weekly appointment mm -hmm. with the therapist in order to have that continuity uh, built in there. And they need to look to help to, to have you develop skills that will help you work with your symptoms, work with your stress load, work with all the things that you're facing. So it's not just about talk therapy, like you said, Adina, it's not just talk, talk, talk. It's helping learn skills, you know, through that. There's no magic bullet. Your relationship with your therapist will develop over time and throughout the years. And you will know when you outgrow a therapist, when it's time to move on from that therapist and find a new one that might have a more intense skill set when you're ready for it. Okay. Um, next comes the psychiatric hunt. That is very, very hard. You want to make sure that it's not just a pill mill. There are a lot of doctors that I've been to, psychiatrists, that it's just like, okay, here's your prescription, you're good to go. Um, not caring about what kind of side effects or symptoms I'm having. It's just kind of like throw the prescription at you and that's it. Not explain the medication to you, not go into the possible side effects because they don't want to scare you. They don't want you to be afraid of what could possibly happen. So I did a lot of intensive research mm -hmm. on Google <laughs> um, to background check my medications and also contraindication mm -hmm. with other meds. I would find that this med was conflicting with this one. And why would they ever put me on those two at the same time? And I was going off the wall with symptoms. I mean, Nikki has followed me in my medication journey. And it's just been literal hell what I've been through with medications. And Nikki, I know you can attest to that. Yeah, I don't think it was until you and dad really just started advocating for yourselves mm -hmm. that things really took a turn. Just the haphazard well, here's this, try this, um, was scary. I mean, and then the withdrawal symptom oh. that doctors don't sometimes even consider or account for, mm -hmm. um, with watching you withdraw from like one medication to the next, I think was probably the scariest like memories I have as a kid. Cause I just was like, are you going to make it, you know, like, are you going to survive the effects of that? And of course, when you're younger too, that's just, it's all heightened and it's unknown. And it's so much more frightening to see your parent go through that. Um, but I feel like that really took a turn um, in my adult life when you and dad just decided, well, we're going to just research everything to the hilt and we're going to know what we're getting into before we get into it. And then fighting too for the doctors. Um, you know, I remember one in Indiana who like cared. I, I mean, I know that that's like, <laughs> he was the best psychiatrist I ever had. He was I, so yeah, good. I knew, I know you remember his name, but I don't remember his name, but that guy, was built different. And I remember he would even write you a like encouraging note on the, the prescriptions and the prescription itself and things like that. So there are people and I think it's even an encouragement to whoever might be watching to just not settle for less than 
being cared for, you know, in your medical journey. Like again, those other doctors that I mentioned, they weren't my doctor. They were ones that were on rotation if she was out of town or whatever. Um, but I was like, y'all don't talk to me like my doctor talks to me <laughs> because, you know, you're over here telling me what to do. And then my doctor was in the waiting room singing Waymaker over me as I was trying, um, trying to dilate in, mm -hmm. in my birth journey. Um, and, you know, so yeah, you just got to kind of have the resolve of um, I'm not going to settle. And then if, you know, sometimes just in your area or whatever, if it's so limited, I would still go back to what we said before of you don't have to just take whatever they say at face value. If, if research, there's no other option, research. yeah, just research. really do your research. Yeah. One psychiatrist I walked out on, I, I knew that I, I could not handle the medication he was trying to prescribe for me. And I told him I had been on it before. I had a really bad experience with it. And he's like, who are you to tell me what to prescribe to you? Wow. And I said, I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. and I walked right out of his office. He was astonished, but you know, honestly, I'm, you don't have to put up with being treated like a number, yeah. like I said, a pill yeah. mill. Because yeah. that's what it gets like for them. The right. psychiatrists, remember, all they do, they are not a therapist. They are not getting into your background. I was dropped on my head as a, as a child type stuff. They are only prescribing medication to you. Yeah. Which I personally think, if we really boil it down, that the very mm -hmm. system so dysfunctional. Like, how is that psychiatrist possibly able to accurately prescribe without having the knowledge. I just have always thought, why have we decided to separate those two? Why have we not required that you have that? And then you're prescribing from an informed place. It's just odd. So obviously it makes sense that you would want to share your story as much as you can with um, a psychiatrist, but Sometimes they'll listen, oftentimes not. They'll right. even just put up a hand and say, just like, stop, stop. That's, that's not my, my, uh, Herbie, my yeah. what I'm looking for. Not my playing field or not my agenda. You know, they, they just don't want anything to do with listening to your, to your past or anything. So they're just <laughs> prescribing off the cuff. Yeah, as, as we are created spirit, soul, and body, and we all it all interacts. And mm -hmm. so if you don't address those, it makes a difference. Uh, I read an amazing book. I don't know if you guys have read this book called Healing the Family Tree. And I can't remember mm -hmm. the guy's name, a uh, psychiatrist, I think, from the UK. And, um, you know, he had, an I think, Episcopalian background. And so, I mean, you know, I don't agree with everything that he did. But what was so amazing is um, if patients didn't respond to the, you know, traditional treatments, he would, you know, begin to ask them questions about their background, about their family tree and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, the testimonies from that book are mm -hmm. so amazing. And I really didn't understand it at that time. Um, you know, some people call it lingering human spirits. Some call them alien human spirits. Uh, I'm trying to think of what Amanda Bies calls them. Uh, she recently did an amazing, you know, um, a discussion on YouTube on um, that possibility. But this, this book was the first one that opened up to me the possibility of some spiritual aspects mm -hmm. um, that mimic some mental health issues and um, mm -hmm. the miracles when this guy would do some, um, you know, take communion and work with the family on certain mm -hmm. issues and find the symptoms gone. <laughs> and so some things mimic, you know, um, mental health issues and have a different route to it. And so that's mm -hmm. so key. That's, in, what Nikki's, that's where Nikki's part is coming in. 
her part's coming in soon. <laughs> She's going to talk about the spiritual aspect to the mental health journey. Um, so, okay, if you have an unsympathetic uh, psychiatrist, you definitely want to work with them uh, to get them over to your side. And if you can't, you move on and you find another one. You also want to know what hospital affiliations they have, what doctor affiliations they have, because God forbid, if you have a situation that lands you in the hospital, you want to make sure that your psychiatrist is licensed to work with that particular hospital. You know, so that's very important also. And I used to look at it as a team approach. I would keep the responsibility and my husband, my husband and I would do this together actually, of having my PCP, my personal care physician, know what my psychiatrist is doing, know what my therapist is doing, know what my woman doctor is doing so that all of them were on the same team and they weren't double prescribing, over prescribing and such like that. That is really not anyone else's responsibility, but yours. Unfortunately, again, it falls on you. Um, your family, if you are uh, working with a minor, your family needs to know the medications. They, the mom and dad need to be in charge of looking into the medications, what the side effects are. I remember I was working with a couple once um, through my church ministry and the wife was the one that was mentally ill. Now she basically was mocha. She couldn't really hold the conversation. She didn't have memory of things. She was just kind of sitting there and observing when we had our classes or our meetings together. And one day I said, John, can you mind divulging to me the medications your wife is on? And when he started to list them, she was on like five, no lie, antipsychotics, three antidepressants, you know, and a partridge in a pear tree. She was on everything. And I said, literally, these meds are shutting your wife down. They are making her so that she cannot function or communicate in the world. So they started to slowly wean her off medications and she was doing so much better, so much better. So you have to be aware of this. Parents don't realize that their kid may be totally over prescribed. And the other thing, and this is really something to be aware of, Say that your child has been diagnosed with um, ADHD and they've been prescribed Ritalin or some type of a uptake medication, they call it, something that's going to speed medication to an ADHD patient calms them down. Mm -hmm. To a regular person, it gives them a high. So your child, unbeknownst to you, and this is, again, where you have to micromanage this, micromanage, not macro, micro, uh, that they're not selling their drugs to their friends at school. Wow. You know? And they could be on antipsychotics, which if you take enough of them, you're going to get a really big high. You can also die from it. You can go into a coma um, you can go into a seizure. So this is really important. Monitor. My husband still to this day, still to this day, monitors all my meds. Every single day I get a bottle one for the morning, two for the afternoon, three for night. I get my meds from my husband. He knows every single medication and he monitors. Now, I'm very lucky that he does that. I am blessed beyond measure that he does that. But that's the kind of babysitting it takes with medication for a psychiatric patient. Yeah. That is the truth. That mm -hmm. is the raw truth. Because you might not even realize, you may think your child is taking their meds, but really they're selling them 
for money to buy a cool pair of sneakers with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The um, last thing I want to talk about, um, well, there's two things really, but very important is getting a safety net around you. You want a safety net of people. And what I'm talking about is you ask their permission. Uh, in other words, my daughter is not in my safety net. Mm -hmm. Okay. They can say, no, I don't want that job. And what that job is anytime, day or night, if I'm having suicidal ideation, if I'm going into a freak out, if I'm having a panic attack, if I'm doing this or that. Now, she did so much of that while she was growing up and while I was so symptomatic and we had no idea what was wrong with me. But you need a safety net of mature friends that know your symptoms that you can call at a moment's notice. And I am that person to certain people. I've had people call me, I'm suicidal right now. Talk me down, help me down from this. So you need a safety net that includes sometimes family, mostly friends, maybe clergy, whatever, you know, whoever it is that's gonna be a part of it. And um, you need to look at what your healing looks like for you. Embrace that journey write it down. Journaling is huge. There's something about putting a pen to paper that you can spill out all those thoughts, even thoughts that you can't say in therapy. And that will give you that knowledge. It's almost like talking to your inner child, you know, like what did that seven-year-old Alice go through that she needs to work through right now? So that's very important. And um, last of all, a lot of people feel that suicide is a very selfish move, that it's something that, you know, how could you be so selfish to commit suicide? I want everybody listening to this broadcast to know that it's not selfishness. It is a symptom of mental illness. Yeah. Suicide is unfortunately a symptom. It's mm -hmm. just as if a person with a heart condition has a heart attack. You don't say, well, that's so selfish of you, yeah. right? A person with diabetes goes into diabetic coma shock. That's so selfish of you. Yeah. Suicide is a byproduct of a diseased brain. Yeah. Okay. Which and I, I fully agree with, and you know, it's um, sad in the church where people put a stigma and believe that someone's going straight to hell if they committed suicide, and exactly. we do not believe that at all. Um, my yeah, husband, it's, it's, you part, know, it's part of the disease. Yeah, my husband, you know, went through a depression as a teenager, and you know, got a gun, and you know, put one in, you know, the chamber. And he did pull the trigger, but it happened to be the round that was empty. And then he, you know, lost heart. He didn't know the Lord at that time, mm -hmm. but then he got scared, you know, and he didn't. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but again, it's, um, you know, it is a symptom of a whole lot more. And, um, you know, it's their desperation uh, trying to get free. It is desperation. It's desperation like you cannot explain to somebody just as you can't explain to somebody who's never given birth what it's like to give birth, we're using all these birthing analogies here. Mm -hmm. um, you can't explain what it's like to first hold that child if somebody hasn't had a baby. Mm -hmm. You can't explain to somebody the sheer frustration, angst, hopelessness, yeah. desperation of suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. You just can't explain it to somebody if yeah. they haven't had it. Yeah. And so, you know, to leave that on an upbeat note, that's where you turn towards that that network of people that you make mm -hmm. so that you have somewhere to go with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if if they're like my daughter and they had enough is enough, and they say <laughs> politely, I don't wish to be a part of that network. But that's okay. You know, there's other things she does for me. And it is a very hard task to talk somebody down from suicide. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's, well, and it's I think not too, easy. not easy. Our so, journey. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Lucy? sorry. I just was saying our journey has our relationship has been protected okay. by me stepping out of a wrong role as daughter. Right. And I'm able to, you know, have my role as daughter reinstated, I think, where it was removed for many years. Right. And the role of caretaker was really the primary role. Um, and so now we get the joys of being mother, daughter, and then my three year old um, granddaughter. And we do things like yesterday. We well, we tried to go to the pool. <laughs> <laughs> but immediately the Florida weather, lightning and thunder came. So anyway, <laughs> we get to do fun things <clears throat> like that where um, <clears throat> there's not a like dual. It's almost like it would require me to mm -hmm. just and I remember this from my childhood be like off on off on. So, so like mm -hmm. when if you're um, the child of a mentally ill parent and they are expecting you to care for them and to talk them down to be their care person um it's very difficult for the child to know when does that start and stop so i would then get reprimanded when mom wasn't in crisis because mm -hmm. i would just continue parenting her right and i would continue and that's real dysfunctional as a child who's called by god to respect and honor and yes. obey their parents. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, no, you're supposed to obey me because I'm a parent and I'm 12. Yes. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it, it's that role reversal that has been so healed in our story. And of course, that's always our hope and prayer that anyone that listens would be able to see and identify some of those areas to kind of examine, man, do, do some of our roles in our family you know, need to be put back together. Um, <clears throat> but to stick with what we've been, the road we've been on, I think one of the ways that um, I was able to have my role reinstated was exactly what mom just mentioned by having a team, a team of people that I didn't even know yet, that I didn't even know that I needed. I didn't even really know existed. I just um, started to display, you know, some emotional outbursts, some symptoms that even I was looking at myself going, who are you? Like, what are you, what are you doing? This isn't you. And um, anyway, I definitely went the route of traditional talk therapy with a therapist who my husband and I still see today. We're probably going on seven years of a journey with her. And um, it's really beautiful that there's been able to be that longevity but then, too, um, there's two things that uh, mom and I thought would be just helpful to, to talk about and even to just suggest to people today as um, those. What, so what I feel, I don't feel like it's an alternative route. I feel like it's everything <laughs> like rather than um, just taking one thing that God has to offer. I want to take everything he has to offer and, you know, he came that we would have life and have it to the full and have it more abundantly. So I think about, man, there's so many tools um, to heal. And so for me, I was doing traditional talk therapy with a licensed Christian counselor. And it got to a point where, you know, um, I'd been able to establish some healthy boundaries mm -hmm. in our family. I'd been able to, like mom said, I learned a lot of skills, mm -hmm. skills that I didn't have. And then the emotions, I just was still all over the map and felt out of control. Um, there's a real significant time where I got into some argument with dad. I don't even remember what it was about. Um, but I was so filled with anger and rage and just that was welling up inside of me that I remember I just, um, was like, what am I going to do with this emotion? I, it was, it was kind of like, you feel like you're crawling out of your own skin mm -hmm. almost. And, um, this was before we had our daughter, thankfully, <laughs> uh, but I'm in my house by myself. I want to say Ross was still working and, 
I just remember thinking, I have to get out of here. I have to run. And I was in, like, if you can imagine, Ked's skinny jeans and a button up shirt from <laughs> work. Okay. And I just fling open my front door and I start sprinting. Wow. Now, like, I'm in a normal suburb of Indiana. <laughs> and sprint from my house a full mile, which if you know me at all, you know that running and I are not friends. So it's not like, oh, well, you just always, no, 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 no. I'm not a runner. And so I mm -hmm. ran and I ran and I ran and I ran until I reached the river, which again was like a little over a mile from our house. And I reached the river and I finally had kind of got all of that height of that emotion out of my body. Hmm. But I just sat at the edge of the river and I'm so thankful I had my phone because I remember I was something in me said, one, you're not OK. <laughs> right. And two, you need to take a photo and remember this moment because this is a marking moment on your healing journey. It just was, mm -hmm. I believe, Holy Spirit. And I took a photo of my shoes because, of course, my little feet were like blistered from, I don't even think I had socks on, like, I don't even know, running. And I put my shoes on the ground. I took this photo and I still have the photo. And I, it's like, like we said at the top of the show, um, rehearse and remember and, and recall and bring to memory all that God has done in your life. Because now if I'm going to run, it's like, I'm on a treadmill for 20 <laughs> you know, barely getting to the point of running. But that moment um, was like this big warning to me in my body, in my brain, you're not okay, something's wrong. So my therapist suggested it's time to consider medication or if you feel like you don't want to yet, um, you could try and the way our church at the time was set up was they had an actual counseling center with licensed therapists and then they also had um, licensed inner healing ministers. And so she suggested that I see <clears throat> one of those ladies that was there. And I honestly, it's so funny to think back, but I really thought it was like crazy. <laughs> I was like, excuse me, you want me to do what? You want me to see an inner healing minister? You know, what I mean? like mm -hmm. it was just so foreign. And um, and so, again, like we've said, I mean, we prayed, my husband and I, and there's even a book I have on my shelf. Um, the ministry is called Splunkna, mm -hmm. and it is a Greek word. And the the word in English just means like inner. And it's referring to literally the inside of you. And so it's like, um, the ministry, again, is that inner healing. We're going to focus on what is deep, deep, deep down. And it focuses in on what's been kind of trapped in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And so when you start talking about these types of things, if you have no frame of reference for it, it can just be confusing or can sound odd. So there actually is a, a book called Splunkna. Yeah. To spell it, it's S-P-L-A-N-K-N-A. -A, and I could probably put it we could probably put it in the comments or something because there's a website as well um, that actually um, the beauty of the website, they now have a feature where you could even today go on there, scroll down to the bottom and you can um, request a phone call with someone even right now. And you can get a 10 minute phone call that can give you probably a better description even than me, but mm -hmm. you know, just to give some idea about what this is, but the, the ministry is the redemptive work of energy psychology. And I want to encourage you to consider that, yes, energy psychology has largely been used by um, the new age, new age theology, right? New age, um, I don't even know what to call them, but just anyone who believes that they can become their own God, right? So we don't believe, sorry? New age community. Yes. So, so we don't believe that, um, the energy within our bodies is like our, um, gateway to actualization or to being 
our own miniature God, right? <laughs> and we believe God is God, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead, who, you know, lived and died, who walked among us. We believe what the Bible says. So that's why it's the redemptive work of that, because there's so many ways, man. So, so the enemy can't create. He can only distort what the Lord God has already made and created. So if you can imagine a picture of, you know, this is my Bible, but a, like a book on a shelf, like you'd see at the store and there's an original price tag, let's say it's a hundred bucks. And then someone's like, well, I'm going to come over and I'm going to mark it down. And it gets an orange price tag on there and it's now 70 bucks. And then it's been sitting. So it's now 50 bucks. Right. And then six months later, now it's 30 bucks. That's what the enemy likes to do with the Lord's original intent for our lives. The Lord's like, I'm going to give you this gift. It's beautiful. It's your inheritance as my child. And then the enemy comes with his ugly orange sticker. And he's like, actually, it's mine. Mm -hmm. the father of our, all lies. So if he's talking, he's lying. So it's not his. The enemy does not have ownership over us. A lot of times we relinquish our rights knowingly or unknowingly. And that's that unknowingly part leads me into the reason a ministry is so powerful because it utilizes um, the testing of your muscles to reveal where the trauma emotions are stored within your body. And so if you can imagine um, little Nikki encountering mom and dad fighting and arguing as I was, again, very small, I remember um, being in the restroom, having bowel issues <laughs> as those arguments were going on, never correlating, you know, but just the stress of the moment there I was in the restroom. And as I went on my journey in the inner healing sessions with my practitioner, we came to a point where you know, she suggested that all the food allergies that I had had and been diagnosed with, there's a chance that there is a spiritual trauma, emotional trauma root. Mm -hmm. And it's not every time. It's not every story is different. Um, just because it happened for me this way, I understand every person's life, you know, looks different. Mm -hmm. But I was, I probably had truly the size of a mustard seed faith of being healed mm -hmm. because I, I've been sick my whole little life in the sense of um, really nearly anything I ate either was mildly, it was bloating. Um, and usually it was either throwing up or diarrhea on a regular basis to where in my teens, um, the, it was so bad that I would basically, if I went to a theme park, I would end up hospitalized at the end of the weekend for dehydration because my body was not retaining the nutrients when you're constantly in the restroom. I mean, six to eight times a day, mm -hmm. you're not retaining water, salt, nutrients. So it was um, in college that I had felt and learned that if I did not eat gluten and dairy, that I would be like mildly okay. Mm -hmm. And I still had other issues. And then suddenly it was like, oh, you can't have onions either. Oh, and you know, like spicy foods, it was just the foods that I could eat were the list was very, very, very small. Um, caffeine. What a sad life without caffeine. Um, <laughs> I just say, what a sad life without coffee. Um, but yeah, so, so I ate that way <clears throat> 11 years and through the course of a two year journey of these intense inner healing and deliverance, really deliverance sessions. Mm -hmm. Each session ends with coming out of agreement with a lie, coming into agreement with truth, mm -hmm. disavowing an inner vow that you once made, going all the way back to womb trauma. I mean, just the depth of the, the depth of the work. I, um, had a hard time believing that I was healed. There was a little voice inside me that was like, you're healed. Then the Lord spoke to me in a dream and he said, you've been healed. And then finally I got the courage to have an M&M and &M. And like, <laughs> like two years ago, I ate an M &M. 
and I was okay. And then I ate a Publix Italian cookie and I was okay. And then I, you know, like I had a cup of coffee and I was okay. And I just used to be, if I had a cross contaminated food, I would be in my bed and the bathroom for three days, like call out of work, call out of school. Like, and so, um, so Splunkna <laughs> is a, a beautiful tool that is, if you, if you want to imagine what the session is like, it is all prayer led. Mm-hmm. So it's all giving the Lordship and the direction of the session to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And by way of Holy Spirit, he'll reveal an age through the muscle test as simple as a press on your wrist. Mm-hmm. The age will be revealed and that, most of the time the the client is aware of a a certain trauma rarely there's things that test um as repressed memories and the lord will heal the trauma the lord is so good he will heal the trauma emotions from a repressed memory and the client does not even have to relive or recall the fullness of the memory to receive the fullness of the healing for that trauma and I've been witnessed that um, because now I'm on the other side of on the journey to become a practitioner. So I'm halfway there and I have um, the second leg of training and um, to, re- to be licensed. It's because it's called the Splunkna Therapy Institute mm-hmm. and to be licensed through that. And then um, just the other ministry that is so beautiful that I've been serving in um, through the last year. It's called Sozo. We love to use Greek words for some reason. <laughs> um, so Sozo is used 114 times in the New Testament. And it is used every time that we're um, we're seeing in scripture refer to what Jesus did on the cross. So he came to Sozo us. And that means to save us, also to heal us, also to deliver us. Mm-hmm. And so many times, like I started, we just take the one thing that God has to offer and we kind of are like, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to settle. And the Lord's like, I didn't come just to save you by the skin of your teeth so that you suffer from now until death. And then you make it into heaven just barely. Mm -hmm. He's like, I came to redeem it all. Mm -hmm. And um, just the idea of a a sozo session, um, you often find them as like, an arm of the church that you're in. They'll, they'll have a prayer ministry. It's the same thing. It's all prayer. It starts with giving Holy Spirit direction and ownership to lead and guide. And there's several tools that really um, Bethel Church in Redding, California, about 20 years ago, um, through because they're a community that operates largely in the prophetic, the Lord downloaded all these tools to them <clears throat> that throughout the session, you would use specific tools to target um, specific yeah, trauma that people have encountered that by way of that trauma has, if you imagine like a, like a plug going into a wall socket, how there's three prongs. If you imagine those three prongs as Father God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, the enemy would love to knock out one or all because he only is here to kill, steal, and destroy. Right. Just like acknowledge. So we'd love to knock one of those out. And our goal in that session is to reconnect that person to the fullness of the Godhead so that that person leaves hearing more clearly from the Lord, knowing um, his heart better and even having a hunger um, for him more and a hunger for the word and being able um, to have, of course, relief from how those those um, traumas can affect you yeah. and weigh on you. And I've seen everything just in one year from um, someone who literally would, would manifest demonically within that session and then be completely like, like I, I can't even describe the person when you would look at them, it did not appear that they were there right? It did not appear that they were home, that the lights are on, yeah. like lights are on, but no one's home. 
and then they are fully restored. They're thinking clearly. Mm -hmm. um, that person specifically is now married with a child in the last year. They have their life is back. They have their life back mm -hmm. to who have been able to go off at least one of their medications because the peace of God is so prevalent now where, we, where they've been disconnected, they've been reconnected and to physical healing. I mean, the Lord has just come for the fullness of life and he is a jealous God and all he wants is everything. <laughs> so That's true. He, he just, um, he just wants it all. And I would encourage anyone today who's listening, if any of this is striking a chord with you, um, like I mentioned about the Splunkna website, the same is true of Sozo. Um, it's called Bethel Sozo. We can put that in the comments as well. The same thing is true. You can go and you can request a session. They do Zoom uh, prayer sessions because that does not involve the muscle testing, the physical Mm -hmm. contact isn't needed. So you can do a prayer session on Zoom and find significant, significant healing, just like I have and mom has. So. Right. I, I wanted to say that I've been through both Splunkna and Sozo. Awesome. So it's not just a journey of what's called the outside stuff. It's also the inside stuff, which is the spiritual and exponentially have grown and developed so much more through that. And um, it's really a magnificent ministry. Both of them are. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm so proud of Nikki that she's going to be a Splunkna leader. That is so tremendous. That is so awesome. I, I read the book a couple of years ago and was intrigued um, about mm -hmm. that. And, and, you know, it's not the only model out there. There's others who are using muscle testing, you know, in mm -hmm. that, that context, um, as well as, you know, what we do in transformations as well. And so the beautiful mm -hmm. thing is all of these different ways that God has created us to heal and to walk mm -hmm. out this journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the biggest thing is including spirit, soul, and body, you know, mm -hmm. in the process and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the process as well. Uh, is simply amazing. And so just the encouragement, it's for, for me, I had to shift from, I just need to get fixed and I'm looking mm -hmm. for someone to fix me to this beautiful, exciting journey mm -hmm. that we get to go on with deeper intimacy with the Lord. And we get to, you know, experience different models and different ways of doing it. Um, you know, that bring us closer to him, closer to one another, closer in the body of Christ. Very true. So it's just awesome. Well, Very I true. so appreciate both of you sharing your journey. Any last mm -hmm. comments or thoughts you'd like to share? Just thank you for allowing us on this platform and to be able to share our testimonies. And hopefully this is going to help somebody out there. Yeah, and that's absolutely. the main reason for doing it. That's exactly right. That's the, the hope, the, the prayer, the goal in all of this that others, you know, would be inspired and encouraged. So thank you, Adina, for yeah. just your your yes, you know, yes. Saying, your testimony mountain. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. And Appreciate all of you tuning in. Just encourage you to like, subscribe, share this with somebody who needs to hear this message today. And also, if you have a testimony, we'd be delighted to um, have you on to share your testimony. And it doesn't have to be a full hour. You know, you can go, well, my testimony, I don't know if I could, you know, is we all have a testimony. And the more and more, as Nikki was saying earlier, we rehearse it, we share it uh, beyond just maybe our friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, it has a ripple impact, you know, frequency yeah. that goes out and that impacts the world. And so it's just a delight to be here today. And again, thank you, Alice and Nikki. And we look forward to seeing you all next time on Testimony Mountain. Thank you, Adina.